Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, the managing editor for Shadowproof. Hello, I'm Brian Sonnenstein, publishing editor of Shadowproof. And uh, we're pleased to have you today for the edition, the January 23rd, 2020 edition of the Dissenter Weekly. Uh, we are going to be covering Glenn Greenwald, the indictment against him that was issued by Jair Bolsonaro's government in Brazil, as well as uh, a major development in Julian Assange's case as far as how the extradition hearing will be unfolding. Cool. And before we dive in, uh, just your usual reminder, please subscribe to the show uh, by clicking the button below. Um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at shadowproof.com. And uh, we are a 100% reader supported organization, including the show. Uh, our ability to do it and do all of our reporting depends entirely on your support. So please head over to shadowproof.com slash donate to check out our options. Uh, and even if you can just kick in the price of a cup of coffee a month, it'll, it'll be a, a, make a big difference for us and our writers. Um, so with that, I want to jump into our first story for this week, Kevin, uh, which is something you covered at Shadowproof. Um, you had a great story up about what's going on with Glenn Greenwald. Um, the title of this story is Anti-LGBT Bolsonaro Government Indicts Glenn Greenwald for Engaging in Journalism. Um, some of our listeners out there might have seen this uh, story come across uh, the headlines over the last couple of days. Can you walk us through it? Yeah, the, you know, the big thing that I think people need to take away is the fact that Glenn Greenwald, is, as well as his partner, David Miranda, have been under attack in Brazil for uh, at least the last year to two years uh, since the rise of Jair Bolsonaro. And, and then with his election, he's a religious fanatic. And uh, there's a bit of an alliance between the Bolsonaro government as well as the Christian right fundamentalists who are inside of the Trump administration um, and who are part of Republican or conservative organizations here in the U.S. We know that Steve Bannon supported the election of Jair Bolsonaro and that there were others who lent their support. And so he's faced death threats. David Miranda uh, took over for the first LGBT member of the Brazilian Congress who fled the country after receiving threats. And uh, David Miranda holds this position now because David was a alternate. And Glenn was involved in doing this reporting, spearheading this reporting for The Intercept on Operation Car Wash, which ultimately led to the sentencing and imprisonment of Lula da Silva, this revered and well-liked uh, populist uh, or leader of the working class in Brazil. Uh, and eventually this reporting that Glenn engaged in along with others at the Intercept Brazil, they were able to spur this decision by prosecutors to go ahead and free him. And that happened last year to free Lula. And so it's upset the Bolsonaro government that attention has been brought to their corruption particularly this prosecutor, Sergio Moro, this, this, this head person who is involved as, as the minister of, uh, I believe it's like safety and public security. So in other words, this is one of the head law enforcement officials in Brazil, oversees surveillance, oversees powers of launching investigations. And, and so Glenn, for at least much of the last year, beginning when the first leaks were published, uh, he's been going around the country. Uh, he's been somebody who has had to use armed guards, had to use an armored vehicle in order to get around or else he, he's, I don't think it's unfair to say, all pretty much resigned himself to a life on house arrest when he's in Brazil because he has to be concerned about the safety of his family as well as his two children who he adopted in 2017. Two boys who have also come under attack with Bolsonaro and other right wingers in Brazil talking as if a gay couple could not possibly be taking care of two boys without having some kind of perversion in the way that they take care of these boys or you know, suggesting that they're, they're, they're not being looked well after and, and that maybe they should be returned 
to the, the, the orphanage or taken back to the place where they were before they were adopted. And, and so this is a big deal. Um, the way that the stories happened were the product of leaks. Glenn Greenwald himself says that the archive is actually larger than the archive that Edward Snowden provided to him and Laura Poitras and uh, was ultimately covered by The Intercept as well. And so it's a huge um, public interest kind of journalism that they've been doing for Brazil and the entire world to show people the nature of the Bolsonaro government, which has this reverence for the military dictatorship that existed decades ago in Brazil. And to get to the other thing I wanted to cover before moving to our next topic, which involves the comparison between the, uh, the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's case and Glenn Greenwald's case. Because of the allegation, uh, people who looked at the criminal complaint, particularly Matthew Ingram over at the Columbia Journalism Review, looked at the criminal complaint and saw that, uh, that they claimed that Greenwald cooperated with hackers and that he played a, quote, clear role in facilitating the commission of a crime. And among other things, Ingram goes on to say, prosecutors claim that Greenwald encouraged the hackers to delete archives of leaked material in order to make it more difficult to connect them with the leaks. They also argue that the Intercept writer was in communication with the hackers while they were listening in on private conversations through apps such as Telegram and that therefore it ceased to operate as a journalist and instead became a member of a criminal conspiracy. For those who have any familiarity with the Julian Assange case, you'll know why this is similar. I mean, essentially, the first charge against Julian Assange was taking away his agency as a journalist and saying he was a conspirator who was trying to help Chelsea Manning crack a password in order to get into databases in which she already had access. And, and so in doing so, in, in, in being willing to try to maybe help her allegedly move around a network anonymously, uh, then Julian Assange ceased to be a journalist, then expanded to target Julian Assange for uh, publishing information. And we'll get into his case some more at the end of the show. But that that cybercrime charge, the conspiracy to commit cybercrime charge, that's part of the leak prosecution against Julian Assange under the Espionage Act. Very similarly, you see the same charge here in Brazil. Thank you for all of that. And I definitely uh, encourage people to go over to Shadowproof and check out um, Kevin's reporting on this. Um, and I think, you know, much like we have said in our discussions about Julian Assange, this is uh, one of those cases where, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of journalists hedging and making qualified statements about expressing solidarity uh, with Glenn Greenwald. Um, and we make no pretenses of doing that here at Shadowproof. This is something that both readers and journalists need to take very seriously uh, and you know, express their solidarity uh, with what's going on with Glenn in um, Brazil. So I'm looking forward to you following this story, Kevin, um, and encourage people to check that out. Um, yeah. Well, can I just so, add? Yeah, go ahead. I, I think what you said is important. Uh, you won't hear us say, while some people may not like Glenn Greenwald or while Glenn Greenwald has possibly done this in the past, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. We're talking about what a government who hates and despises LGBTQ people is doing to a journalist. And, you know, perhaps they would do it even if Glenn wasn't gay. But that identity, I think, plays a role in being able to get away with it simply for the fact that, and I didn't mention this when I was introducing the topic simply for the fact that the federal police already did a preliminary review to see whether Glenn Greenwald committed a crime when mm -hmm. he was engaged in journalism and, and soberly without interest in religious fanaticism, the federal police who have to protect security made a, cons uh, uh, made a decision that Glenn Greenwald had been professional in the way that he managed material that was handed over to the intercept and published from this archive. Right. And I, I believe if I remember from editing your piece, they said that he exercised extreme caution in his handling of that, uh, that information. So um, 
you know, like I said, I encourage people to, to read Kevin's report. It's very good. And, um, you know, we will be on top of this story as it develops. Um, with that, I would like to take us to our next story, Kevin, if that's all right with you. Um, we have FBI whistleblowers still seek appeal rights after 2016 law falls short. Uh, can you walk us through this? Well, the FBI employees were granted an expansion of their rights under the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. And the story that I have from the federalnewsnetwork.com says that an employee, Darren Jones, was fired in 2012 after he made disclosures alleging FBI violated procurement law. And he appealed his termination with the Justice Department Inspector General and submitted a case to the Merit Systems Protection Board. It's possible that those watching aren't familiar with this body, but essentially within the government, they handle administrative appeals outside of the judicial system because the federal government uh, does not want agencies to have employees go to the courts and litigate. So they've traditionally set up their own parallel procedure. The, The Justice Department dismissed his case because he blew his whistle, blew the whistle to his supervisors, not one of the nine top level FBI or Justice Department officials. His case led to a change in law in 2016, but the Justice Department still has not reopened the case. And yeah, it used to be that for the FBI in particular, there were only a certain small set of people that you had to know when you were about to blow the whistle that you should go talk to first. And if you talk to anybody else before, if you went to your supervisor, you were essentially disqualified from being able to blow the whistle on corruption and any retaliation that happened. If you were fired, you know, they basically could have their way with you as an FBI employee. Uh, So uh, people who have worked on this, senators who have uh, been involved in fighting for whistleblower protections are appalled that, frankly, the Justice Department hasn't taken up Darren Jones's case and gone ahead and allowed him to have his day in court. It's been eight years that Darren's been trying to fight for a, a resolution to this case. The financial as well as personal burden on him and his family has been tremendous as it is for any whistleblower who has to fight for their rights. He apparently has some litigation experience, which has made it easier for him to manage and uh, fight for his rights. But at the same time, this points to a wider issue, which is, and I don't know that everybody knows this, but as far as agencies go in the federal government, the FBI has always, always done what it could to deprive whistleblowers from having protections. Thank you for that. Um, And just a reminder to folks, we will have links to all of these stories in the description uh, after the show and on Shadowproof. Um, I wanna take us quickly to our next story, uh, which involves the Dodd-Frank Act. The headline we have here is whistleblowers under Dodd-Frank Act allege fraud at hedge fund in Florida. What's going on in this story? We're highlighting this story to show that the Dodd-Frank Act is apparently working. I mean, we know that under President Barack Obama, this was passed and there is a process for whistleblowers to bring forward claims. So the M- so NBC News reported uh, this past week that three employees of the TCA Fund Management Group's Global Credit Master Fund, a hedge fund, filed a complaint with the Securities and Exchange Commission. They are protected whistleblowers under the Dodd-Frank Act. They allege that the fund has, quote, failed to book losses on defaulted loans and has recorded fee revenues it has not received and never will, end quote. And that's according to the NBC News report. Uh, The group has apparently $300 million in assets, not $500 million, which is what they've claimed. And they're earning 1.92% a year, not 7 or 8%. Uh, as far as rates go. So part of the reason these whistleblowers took action was because they believed that the SEC was ignoring the full extent of the misconduct. So you have two things happening. One, the SEC is paying attention to this TCA fund management groups, hedge fund thing that they have going here. And they have taken an interest in irregularities and seeing activity that looks to be fraudulent. But these whistleblowers say that In fact, they're not actually paying attention to everything that's going on. And if 
they didn't speak up. They were afraid that the SEC was going to uh, make some kind of settlement with the, the, the group and, and not actually hold everyone accountable for what is really happening. And, and they weren't going to take care of the extent of the way that uh, d- different uh, monies are being thrown around, bandied about, numbers are being bandied about. And, and it's, it's sort of one of those things where if you're not keeping track of the payments and everything, eventually the whole thing can just collapse and fold, it, fold in on itself. And uh, I mean, it's a huge mess and it can cause financial problems because we're talking about this is a lot of money. Thank you for that. Um, I want to take us to our next story. This is something we have covered on the show before, something that you've reported on uh, concerning the alleged uh, chemical attack in Doma, Syria. Um, the headline we have here is OPCW specialist testifies at UN, says no chemical attack in Syria occurred. Um, what's the update on this story, Kevin? Yeah, so the OPCW specialist, Ian Henderson, who has been behind uh, a lot of the recent attention to this in the past year, uh, that includes the documents that were provided to WikiLeaks that show what was going on. He testified via video at the UN Security Council. He's a former member of this inspection team that was established to investigate the alleged chemical attack in Doma, Syria in April 2018. He said by the time of the interim report in July 2018, the team he was a part of had, quote, serious misgivings that a chemical attack had occurred, end quote. He conducted engineering and ballistic studies of cylinders at the scene, and the findings further supported the view that there was no chemical attack, he added. Uh, He, I want to point out, said to the UN Security Council that he did not see this as a political debate that this was an issue of how a process was not followed that should have been followed by uh, the OPCW. And I think that points to how this whole entire attack, but then the entire Syria conflict itself has been so highly politicized with factions developing uh, that have been very fractious and resulted in certain people becoming despised and blacklisted from being able to work. And Ian Henderson is particularly concerned that as a professional, he would suffer the same fate. Uh, And so he also said that he did not want to be viewed as a whistleblower. There's a stigma that he thinks is attached to that label. And that's often a feeling that people who are whistleblowers have. Um, They don't really want to be called a whistleblower because they feel like that, again, is going to make it hard for them to continue work as a professional. Uh, so I encourage you to go to the gray zone and look at this report. They they have a comprehensive report there. OPC investigator testifies at UN that no chemical attack took place in Doma, Syria. It's got a full breakdown with some important context that we're not going to have time to cover to cover today. Uh, but again, we're following this. This is catapulted into uh, the public's attention again because of the work that WikiLeaks was doing to publish documents from uh, r- related to the investigation. And then Ian Henderson was doing his diligence by uh, speaking to the UN Security Council this past week. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll have links to uh, the Gray Zone story um, in the description. Um, I think we should turn to uh, our last and regular segment on this show, talking about the case of Julian Assange. We had some news this week uh, on the extradition hearing that it has been split into two parts. Um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? It's this is major. Um, it's personally major. It's also major for Assange. I, mean, I, I just had to change my plans to go to London um, and you know that everything's going to be set, and we're going to have this extradition hearing that was originally going to be uh, four days, and then it was three to four weeks, and now it's going to be one week in February, and then it's going to be three weeks in May. And so, starting February twenty fourth, there is going to be a hearing in Julian Assange's extradition case where we're going to hear arguments around uh, whether this is a political prosecution. Uh, they're going to talk about the surveillance against Julian Assange while he was in the embassy. 
Um, and they're going to dig into those issues of whether his rights would be protected if he came to the United States, I believe. Uh, those are the arguments that the uh, judge plans to hear in his case. And then going forward in May, it'll be a larger hearing with the uh, U.S. government putting on its full case. And uh, tied to this uh, administrative hearing that happened on January 23rd in the morning, we have this big news from the WikiLeaks editor-in-chief who took over from Julian Assange, Kristen Harafson, who has shared that he saw an affidavit that suggests that U.S. prosecutors do not believe Julian Assange is protected by the First Amendment. At least that's what they are planning to argue. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Kristen is saying that when he goes to trial in the U.S., they would deny him press protections uh, and that this affidavit that they have, uh, he revealed this outside of the hearing. He was talking to journalists and that states that foreign nationals like Assange are not entitled to the First Amendment. So I haven't seen this affidavit personally. I'm very eager to see what kind of an argument the United States is advancing, but it seems very dangerous um, and extremely serious, as Christian says, because I think it opens the door for other powerful countries to deny the rights of uh, press freedom to journalists that they don't want in their country investigating corruption. I can imagine uh, China and Russia, uh, maybe North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Israel. I can imagine those countries wanting to mimic the United States and deny press freedom to foreign journalists using the same kind of pattern and practice that the U.S. wants to apply to Julian Assange in this case. So that's a really important development. Again, there's more to flush out here. We just have the statement from Christian, but I, uh, but the media is reporting that this was said outside of the hearing. Uh, there's concerns about his health. Uh, people who are seeing him continue to say things like it, he's spiraling downward day by day. Uh, we still haven't resolved the issue of access to Julian Assange that the defense is having trouble with getting access to him to work on the case. Uh, the, the volume of material that has to be dealt with in this case led prosecutors to agree to postponement. Uh, but for the longest time, they didn't want to, even though the defense was demanding a postponement so that they could have more time with Julian Assange before the extradition hearing. The judge was actually reluctant to split up this hearing. Uh, and I think that's worth noting just because she really wants to get this done as quickly as possible feeling like it's dragged on enough already. Uh, moving it to May means that there's going to be even more time that Julian Assange is in prison. And I think there's con there continues to be a concern about the confinement conditions in which he is being held at Her Majesty's Prison, Belmarsh. That's essentially the update for now. Uh, we can go to the wrap. Uh, at the end of the show, we like to run down the several cases that we're tracking and uh, that includes Julian Assange. We just give you an update, a sense of what's going on with them in terms of the time that they've been incarcerated. Chelsea Manning has been in jail for 316 days as of today. She owes $207,000 in fines. Uh, and that's because she is resisting a grand jury that's set to destroy WikiLeaks and has been working to destroy WikiLeaks since 2010. Assange in jail for 287 days uh, since he was expelled from the Ecuadorian embassy in London, uh, you know, survived and endured lots of persecution since. Um, and that first hearing, again, as we said, is going to look at some of the allegations of violations of privacy, of surveillance against him in the embassy. It'll be a really crucial hearing, uh, which I plan to be at to cover the entire week. And if it spills over into a second week, I'll be there to cover that as well to, to bring you the latest developments related to the Assange hearing. Uh, Jeremy Hammond's in the same facility as Chelsea Manning. He is also charged with, or accused of 
criminal contempt or sorry, just civil contempt because he has not complied with going before the grand jury to testify against WikiLeaks. Reality winner is in a prison serving a sentence for violating the Espionage Act. She's in uh, Carswell in Texas. Terry Albury is an FBI whistleblower who is serving his sentence. And then Daniel Hale is the alleged drone whistleblower who still is set to stand trial at some point this year for providing allegedly documents to The Intercept about the drone assassination program in the United States. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, And as it stands, our hope is that with the support of our readers, we'll be able to send you uh, in February and again in May uh, to cover both of those proceedings. We want to have you there uh, with all of your knowledge and background on these stories um, to be there covering this story uh, in, uh, in ways that a lot of, you know, mainstream and establishment journalists are not situated to do. Um, so I just wanted to let people know that what was going to be one trip is uh, shaping up to be two trips for Kevin. Uh, lucky you get to fly across <laughs> the Atlantic twice. Um, so, yeah, like I said, um, if we can wrap up here, Kevin, I don't know if you have anything else, of course, jump in. Um, well, as I, as I play with my hair that is not cooperating <laughs> and create a nice show blooper here at the end. Um, no, uh, I think it's hugely important for people to be there. Uh, it's difficult to plan around this, uh, and we'll, we'll need you if you really want Assange reporting to support us. Uh, there are incidental expenses in trying to keep up with how things are fluid and they change. Uh, We hear one day that the hearing is going to be three weeks. We hear later that it's one week and then it's going to be three weeks another month. Or we could hear in uh, the next month in February, we could hear that, all right, they're going to meet. It's going to be one week. uh, Then they're going to break and then they're going to come back for another week. And then they're going to do Uh, two weeks next time, and then you have to change travel plans again. And uh, all those changes, trying to keep up with them, incurs its set of fees. Um, And some outlets who are more established might have funds ready and available to to deal with that. Um, Smaller outlets like Shadowproof have to turn to you and ask us to try to absorb that change quickly so that we don't have to make the decision to abandon our commitment to covering the story. Uh, We don't want it to be probatively expensive so that we have to decide not to cover this important case. Um, I want to be there. Um, So, you know, you, if you really want uh, reporting um, and you'd like diligent coverage, I encourage you to go to shadowproof.com and donate. Um, I'm going to be there. I'm planning to be there into the second week. And if there isn't a case that is unfolding, if the hearing has ended on Friday, then I'll be in London to talk to some people connected to Julian Assange's case to provide some interviews and additional insights into what's happening with the extradition case against Julian Assange. Uh, And then, of course, looking forward to May, you know, once we go through what happens in February, that'll be a nice run through to to see what it takes to get into the court on a daily basis and then to go through everything and come back with that experience so that we can do an even better job in May of covering three weeks. That will be even more intense. Um, But I'm going to look to people who watch this show. I'm going to look to people who read Shadowproof. I'm going to look to people who see our work republished around the internet and places like, let's say, Common Dreams to help us and and keep this crucial reporting coming so that you can stay informed about what's happening in Assange's case. I wouldn't defer to CNN. I wouldn't defer to New York Times. I wouldn't wait to see what kind of reporting you get from outlets that have not spent the last year, uh, especially beginning in April 2019, covering every development with Assange every step of the way. And that's what Shadowproof has been doing. Shadowproof, if you go there, you can look at our archive. We've been documenting 
all aspects of Assange's case. And so I think uh, I want you to believe that we should be an authority on the story. And I'd like to encourage you to help fund our reporting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to your reporting. I know our readers, watchers, listeners are as well. We will have more information um, on how you can support that effort. For now, if you're interested in donating, just head over to shadowproof.com slash donate. Um, but we'll be also putting out, sending out emails and tweets and letting people know when we're raising funds. So um, please come out. Yeah, go for it. And I know you need to sign off, but I do want to mention there's the book at OR Books in defense of Julian Assange. Yes. And with the developments like this happening as we get closer to the extradition hearing and after, uh, this is a great volume of writing from activists, a uh, few journalists, writers who allowed material to be republished, people who have been advocates for Julian um, and others who contributed their own pieces to say why uh, it's crucial to stand up for Julian and why there's a lot at stake with his case. So you can find that at OR Books if you're interested. And I contributed a piece on WikiLeaks and the Democrats, and it's an original piece. You can't find it anywhere else. It hasn't been published at Shadowproof. In order to read it, you have to buy the book. And uh, also Margaret Kimberly is another colleague who did a really great piece about Julian Assange and uh, the way the U.S. government uh, uh, turned on him and the way that the Donald Trump's administration turned on him. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good way to, you know, if you, if you want something in return for your support, that book, actually, the money from it is going to, uh, I believe, uh, part of it at least is going to the Courage Foundation or it's going to a group that's helping with Julian Assange's defense. So, uh, if, if you know you want to re support reporting, we really want that. But if also you feel compelled to do something for Julian, that's another uh, avenue available. Absolutely. <clears throat> and we'll pass around a link to purchase the book from OR. Um, and with that, um, I would say just remind people to please subscribe to the show, subscribe to our channel. Um, we're very grateful for all the views and comments and feedback that we've gotten. We'd love to hear more. You can email us at editors. Uh, editor at shadowproof.com follow us on facebook and twitter and just one more time you know please help us send kevin to the uk help us pay our writers to uh, report on stories that are uh, underappreciated in other news outlets um, and you can do that by making a one-time donation or subscribing at shadowproof.com um, and with that kevin thank you so much for all of this uh, a lot of really good information and i'm looking forward to uh moving forward with this and following up on some of these stories in the near future. Take care.